In this lecture, I am going to look at our postmodern world and what some people have called immaterial labor or production by immaterial labor and the possibilities of human liberation, of human emancipation. This uh, will be done by linking um, the theory of immaterial labor um, with a theory of value that uh, I have been trying to develop along with uh, some others, uh, something we can call qualitative labor theory of value. Uh, it will also deal with some ideas about complex systems. To begin with, we can go back to something that Keynes, the great economist from the 20th century, wrote in 1926. What he wrote then relates directly to complex human systems even today. Keynes wrote, we are faced at every turn with problems of organic unity, of discreteness, of discontinuity. The whole is not equal to the sum of the parts. Comparisons of quantity fail us. Small changes produce large effects. The assumptions of a uniform and homogeneous continuum are not satisfied. Without being aware, just as in his general theory 10 years later, Keynes here follows Marx, although in a more modern language. If anything, the development of capitalism since the 1920s has heightened this complexity that Marx noted in both the Grundrisse and in several volumes of Das Kapital. What is more, the complexity now permeates the social, economic, and political organizations, and even the psychological landscape of human subjects. Not only that, but according to Foucault, docile bodies are shaped in order to serve the interests of capital. The purpose uh, of this lecture today is to extend some of the concepts of immaterial labor, general intellect, and biopolitics in order to form a more liberatory concept of opposition to capital's power under late capitalism, as Mandel, Jameson, and others have characterized the current postmodern era. I will try to avoid unnecessary empirical controversies. I will therefore focus here on the hypothetical and theoretical questions. First of all, what is an analytically useful characterization of immaterial labor? Secondly, if we reject the labor theory of value in its original Marxist form, or even some of the more uh, modern formulations such as Okishio, Morishima, Romar, is there still a way to define exploitation, class oppression, and class struggle in order to present the liberatory aspects of labor and its movements, even as it is alienated and dominated under capital? I start by answering these two analytical questions or attempting to answer these two analytical questions. To anticipate, there is an analytically useful version of the concept of immaterial labor, which can include, as Marx put it, the creation of, quote, social brain, unquote, but also an alienated social heart. Furthermore, the social production of docile but contradictory bodies is also a part of the process of producing and using immaterial labor power. At one extreme could be the cyborg hybrid, although there is a continuum from the 19th century factory type labor power to the postmodern cyborg type 
in material labor power. With ecological challenges such as climate change and the appropriation of the social commons, the urgency with which the contradictions in the social brain, social heart, and docile body can play out increases greatly. The upshot here is that a complex strategy of resistance against capital is needed at many different levels and the usual formulations do not go far enough in exploring the unevenness of capitalist development and its political consequences even as immaterial labor becomes relatively more important in social reproduction. On the second question, my answer is that if we reject the quantitative theory of value in Marx, it may spell the death of the theories advanced by Vernal, Hart, and Negri as formulated so far, but not all possible theories based on the importance of immaterial labor. Formulating a qualitative labor theory of value can give greater scope for including capitalist exploitation, alienation, and their specific forms with the development of immaterial labor. Based upon previous work by Rubin and others, a version of this theory has been developed. Using this qualitative labor theory of value, the question of immaterial labor within this theoretical framework can be taken up. Indeed, I shall take this up. I also formulate the questions initially following the dialectical approach of the Japanese Marxist Kozo Uno as problems from the point of view of pure capitalism or capital as such. This world of pure capitalism, as we know, is completely upside down. But as Uno has shown, this theoretical move to the world of pure capitalism offers great clarity. Only after we can see the world as capital, theoretically is compelled to define it, can we move beyond the realm of capitalist appearances into a critical and emancipatory theory for overcoming exploitation and alienation. I now turn to the first question raised at the beginning. So, what is an analytically useful characterization of immaterial labor? The discovery in the 1930s of two previously unknown texts by Marx considerably advanced our understanding of Marx's analysis of capital. The first is Grundrisse and the second is an originally planned part seven of the first volume of Das Kapital. In Grundrisse, to be exact, on page 706, the reference to general intellect in the fragment on machines is a tantalizing entree into the concept of immaterial labor and the social brain. But it is altogether too brief, though highly suggestive. The other segment, which was called in original German, uh, Resultate des Unmittelbaren Produktion Prozesses, was first published in 1933 and now forms an appendix to Capital Volume 1. In this appendix, Marx carries out an extended analysis of formal versus real subsumption of labor. The extended discussion has many points of interest, but for our purposes, the relevant point is that formal subsumption occurs under the regime of producing absolute surplus value, whereas real subsumption occurs under the regime of producing relative surplus value. The latter leads to capitalist labor processes per se and ultimately to the changed character of social labor itself. This is becoming manifest at the level of both national economies and the world economy under globalization. To begin with, the creation of relative surplus value requires revolutionizing the means of production. 
More than that, over time, capital organizes labor, which is its obverse, alienated side, by combining state power and all other ideological and non-state apparatuses for this purpose. In a post-Freudian psychoanalytic sense, the schizophrenia of capital attempts a homogenization of social labor while enhancing its social productivity in an alienated universe. The discursive sides of capital articulate this theoretically as so many theories of technical progress, new economy, knowledge-based economy, post-industrial economy, etc. Once again, without getting involved in empirical issues, we can ask, what are the theoretical conditions for any of these characterizations to have meaning? I repeat, what are the theoretical conditions for any of these characterizations to have meaning? The answer is that we need to conceive of the needs of capital as overcoming barriers that are created by capital itself. The greatest, bar greatest barrier to capital is capital itself, as Marx had already observed. The resistance of workers requires varying strategies by the capitalists individually and as a class. Thus, while technical change from capital's point of view is a technical issue of scientific management, from labor's point of view, it is fraught with difficult questions of conduct conducting class struggles of various sorts. As the Italian theorist Lazzarato observes, and I quote, all the characteristics of the post-industrial economy, both in industry and society as a whole, are highly present within the classic forms of immaterial production, audiovisual production, advertising, fashion, the production of software, photography, cultural activities, and so forth. The activities of this kind of immaterial labor force us to question the classic definitions of work and workforce because they combine the results of various different types of work skill. Intellectual skills as regards the cultural informational content, manual skills for the ability to combine creativity, imagination, and technical and manual labor, and entrepreneur entrepreneurial skills in the management of social relations and the structuring of that social cooperation of which they are a part. This immaterial labor constitutes itself in forms that are immediately collective and we might say that it exists only in the form of networks and flows. He then goes on to uh, the discussion of the organization of production through immaterial labor. And I quote again, the organization of the cycle of production of immaterial labor because this is exactly what it is. Once we abandon our factoryist prejudices, a cycle of production is not obviously apparent to the eye because it is not defined by the four walls of a factory. The location in which it operates is outside in the society at large, at a territorial level that we would call the basin of immaterial labor. Small and sometimes very small productive units, often consisting of only one individual, are organized for specific ad hoc projects and may exist only for the duration of those particular jobs. The cycle of production comes into operation only when it is required by the capitalist. Once the job has been done, the cycle dissolves back into the networks and flows that may make possible the reproduction and enrichment of its productive capacities. Precariousness, hyper-exploitation, mobility and hierarchy are the most obvious characteristics of metropolitan immaterial labor. 
behind the label of the independent, self-employed worker, what we actually find is an intellectual proletarian, but who is recognized as such only by the employers who exploit him or her. It is worth noting that in this kind of working existence, it becomes increasingly difficult to distinguish leisure time from work time. In a sense, life becomes inseparable from work. This labor form is also char characterized by real managerial functions that consist in one, a certain ability to manage its social relations, and two, the eliciting of social cooperation within the structures of the basing of immaterial labor. End of quote. My working hypothesis then is that the cycle of immaterial labor takes as its starting point a social labor power that is independent and able to organize both its own work and its relations with business entities. Industry does not form or create this new labor power, but simply takes it on board and adapts it. Industry's control over this new labor power presupposes the independent organization and free entrepreneurial activity of the labor power. Advancing further on this terrain brings us into the debate on the nature of work in the post-Fordist phase of the organization of labor. Among economists, the predominant view of this problematic can be expressed in a single statement. Immaterial labor operates within the forms of organization that the centralization of industry allows. Moving from this common basis, there are two differing schools of thought. One is the extension of neoclassical analysis. The other is that of systems theory. In the former, the attempt to solve the problem comes through a redefinition of the problematic of the market. It is suggested that in order to explain the phenomena of communication and the new dimensions of organization, one should introduce not only cooperation and intensity of labor, but also other analytic variables. Anthropological variables? Immaterial variables? No one seems to know. But that, on this basis, one might introduce other objectives of optimization and so forth. In fact, the neoclassical model has considerable difficulty in freeing itself from the coherence constraints imposed by the theory of general equilibrium. The new phenomenologies of labor, the new dimensions of organization, communication, the potentiality of spontaneous synergies, the autonomy of the subjects involved, and the independence of the networks were neither foreseen nor foreseeable by a general theory that believed that material labor and an industrial economy were indispensable. Beyond terms such as service work, intellectual labor, and cognitive labor, immaterial labor is problem-solving labor requiring abstract reasoning and symbolic manipulation in the postmodern setting. Furthermore, immaterial labor is affective. It's effective labor in the sense that it has to do with marketing of emotions. In practice, the two aspects are usually combined. Following Foucault, one can extend the notion farther to the realm of biopolitics and the production of docile bodies and minds. It also produces a discourse of immaterial labor that may either serve the ruling class or can become a critical theory that may lead towards liberation. However, in order to make our theory more precise, three further observations and extensions are in order. First, we must speak of immaterial labor power rather than immaterial labor as such. The long socialization in the patriarchal family influence 
of the consciousness industry and other ideological apparatuses are intended to create a type of laboring capacity that was not present in the earlier type of abstract labor. Second, we need an analysis of the forms of value that this labor power can create. However, the usual Marxian theory of value runs into conundrums here. Is the rate of surplus value well defined under all circumstances? Is it possible to transform value into price generally? The social working day may be more or less depending on a number of conditions related ultimately to class struggle and measurement of value objectively in quantitative terms may run into problems. A qualitative labor theory of value is a possible theoretical way out. Third, immaterial labor still is material in a Marxian Hegelian sense. A concrete institutional complex is necessary in order to give social meaning to the term. In dynamic terms, the evolution of such labor and labor power can vary in a non-linear way with unpredictable results. New forms of immaterial labor can emerge with disruptive potential. Once again, a qualitative labor theory of value can offer some insights even when the evolutionary trajectory is not specifically predictable. The properties of immaterial labor are not just functional for post Fordism. Once this viewpoint comes to dominate within social production, we find that we have an interruption in the continuity of models of production. By this, I mean that unlike the position held by many theoreticians of post Fordism, I do not believe that this new labor power is merely functional to a new historical phase of capitalism and its processes of accumulation and reproduction. This labor power is the product of a silent revolution taking place within the anthropological realities of work and within the reconfiguration of its meanings. Wage labor and direct subjugation to organization no longer constitute the principal form of the contractual relationship between the capitalist and worker. A polymorphous self-employed autonomous work has emerged as the dominant form. A kind of intellectual worker who is himself or herself an entrepreneur inserted within a, within a market that is constantly shifting and within networks that are changeable in time and space. So we come to the other question now. If we reject the labor theory of value in its original Marxist form, or even the Okishio, Morishima, Romar formulations, is there still a way to define exploitation, class oppression, and class struggle in order to present the liberatory aspects of labor, even as it is alienated and dominated under capital? The key question in the qualitative labor theory of value is different from the one asked in Capital Volume 3 regarding the transformation problem. The famous transformation problem has its origins in Volume 3 of Capital and the various controversies it generated would easily fill several volumes. Without rehearsing this, I want to emphasize that the transformation problem is not simply about how to get the prices of production from labor values. It is also, and more fundamentally, about how the rate of profit is determined in a comparative capitalist economy. Recent developments in formalizing this approach show that prices of production and the rate of profit are determined simultaneously. Marx's famous formula for the definition and calculation of the average rate of profit is therefore not generally valid. There are some special cases for which Marx's formulation is still correct, but generally it is not correct. So I will not pursue the many interesting questions that can be raised within the quantitative approach. Uh, I will uh, focus from here on to um, uh, uh, on the qualitative approach and see how it relates to the problems that the concept of immaterial labor or immaterial labor power um, raises in our time.
so uh, the question we ask is what kind of value form can arise when immaterial labor power has become a key form of labor power here i also want to acknowledge the pioneering role of the soviet political economist i i rubin who posed uh, the question about the social form of commodity uh, mainly the value form uh, under capitalism and uh, indeed rubin made considerable progress in answering uh, questions related to the social form of value however he and the work that follows him did not pose the question of alienated labor in value form and the pervasive alienation in com commodity producing societies in general it also made it impossible to look at the connection between non-market production and the value form two key instances are household labor of women and the non-commodity sectors in many developing countries on the periphery. It can be argued that in order to pose the problem correctly, we will need to understand the connections between capital as an asymmetric dominating set of social and political relations between classes and the production and distribution of commodities where both labor and commodities undergo periodic and crisis-ridden contradictory transformations. For domestic labor as such, one approach is the dual system that arose from the question of how capitalist and domestic exploitation are articulated. This issue fueled the domestic labor debate of the 70s and early 80s. In the context of our discussion above, this debate focused on the question whether household labor creates value and whether it is exploited. Implicitly, value always meant capitalist exchange value. Domestic production was analyzed in its relation to the capitalist class process and not as a class process in its own right. Hence, the link between household labor and capitalist commodity production was the labor power of the worker. As one astute observer comments, household labor obviously plays a crucial role in the reproduction of the worker. So, the discussion analyzed whether household labor creates the commodity labor power or simply the living worker. And, assuming that it does produce labor power, whether it creates value and surplus value. Others argued that household labor does not create value, but does, although indirectly, contribute to capitalist surplus value by lowering the value of labor power. Implicit in all these arguments seems to be that for domestic labor to be exploited, it has to contribute to capitalist surplus value production. Hence, I agree with those who say that the two errors frequently reproduced in much of the domestic labor literature, that of assimilating housework into the capitalist mode of production and that of placing housework in a wholly functional relation to capitalism compounded the difficulty of analysis. For my argument here, the point is that the domestic labor issue points to the complexity of assuming real subsumption of labor everywhere and of making the theoretical assumption that all immaterial labor is being commodified. Domestic labor, although it is exploited, need not assume a social value form as defined in the capitalist political economy. The book by Sanyal points to the non-capitalist sectors, which are technically called the Z good sector, which are destroyed but not completely as primitive accumulation occurs. Secondly, and almost simultaneously with the capitalist development, the exclusion of large numbers, analogous to Foucault's ship of fools, by the capitalist sectors poses the problem of creating a need-based sector. To the, to the extent that Foucault's idea of governmentality is apl applicable to these economies, a biopolitical and population-oriented governmentality as opposed to simple sovereignty problem 
must be solved. It is uncontroversial perhaps to point out that the main objective of capital was to explain the origin and development of the capitalist economic formation in terms of the developing relationships between human beings as producers. In his magisterial survey of the origins and significance of the labor theory of value, Ronald Meek went on to add, it had to be shown in the case of both commodity production in general and of capitalist commodity production in particular, that a definite form of production determines the forms of consumption, distribution, exchange, and also the mutual relations between these various elements. In this demonstration, the labor theory of value evidently played a key role, since it is in effect a particular way of stating that social relations of production determine relations of exchange. Though not uncontroversial, this can be, under some conditions, an approximately methodologically correct and scientifically fruitful way of proceeding, capable of being explored further following the path of inquiry opened up by the Russian theorist Rubin. However, I would like to push the scope of capital and the labor theory of value farther at this point by posing the question of conceptualizing immaterial labor in the context of the dialectics of capital and of value as a social form. As Engels correctly stated in his speech on Marx's graveside, Marx was first and foremost a revolutionary. Losing sight of this fact can lead one to treat Marx's work as only an academic attempt to understand capitalism. Although there is nothing wrong with academic attempts to understand capitalism, in Marx's case, such an interpretation limits the scope of his most important scientific work quite unnecessarily. Surely, Marx wanted to analyze capital as a social relation and to a large degree succeeded in understanding capitalism from a scientific point of view. More importantly, however, he also wanted to contribute politically to the project of overcoming capital. What Marx said of science in general, that it is always critical and revolutionary, applies with particular force to Marx's approach to the political economy of capitalism. I want to argue that following this line of thought with respect to the qualitative labor theory of value can show this theory to be both critical and revolutionary and capable of handling development of new forms of labor, such as immaterial labor. The political project that emanates from a fully developed theory is nothing other than that of overcoming capital, regardless of what new categories of concrete labor arise in the process of capitalist development. In 1850, writing about class struggles in France, Marx had already declared, this socialism is the declaration of the permanence of the revolution the class dictatorship of the proletariat as the necessary transit point to the abolition of class distinctions generally, to the abolition of all the relations of production on which they rest, to the abolition of all the necessary social relations that correspond to these relations of production, to the revolutionizing of all the ideas that result from these social relations. So how does an understanding of qualitative labor theory of value help us comprehend how and why an all-around class struggle must be waged, even if labor is immaterial primarily at this stage of capitalist development in order to overcome all oppressive political, economic, and social relations under capitalism? I take as my starting point the discussion of the twofold nature of value and commodity fetishism in the chapter on commodities in Capital, Volume 1. Here, of course, Marx is trying to deal with the appearances or forms of exchange under capitalist relations of production. However, Marx's method of presentation is intended only to lead the reader from this realm of appearances to the realm of deeper causal relations obscured by these appearances. Therefore, in contrast with the already appearing vulgar theories of exchange and the currently fashionable price and value theory of the neoclassical school, Marx posits abstract labor as the substance of value. 
To Marx, it was clear that the allocation of labor in social production among different branches of production was a natural requirement for the reproduction of the economy and society. Marx accepted such a requirement as an axiom, as he stated clearly in his letter to Kugelmann in July 1868, that this necessity of distributing social labor in definite proportions cannot be done away with by the particular form of social production, but can only change the form, it assumes, is self-evident. No natural laws can be done away with. What can change in changing historical circumstances is the form in which these laws operate. In this same, same letter, Marx repeats his point from the first chapter of Capital Volume 1 that exchange value as a social form appears, quote, in a state of society where the interconnection of social labor is manifested in the private exchange of the individual products of labor. In his seminal contribution, Rubin makes a general claim about Marx's political economy with which Marx's claims about the exchange value form are completely consistent. Rubin wrote in the 1920s, political economy which deals with the production relations among people in the commodity capitalist economy presupposes concrete economic formation of society. We cannot correctly understand a single statement in Marx's capital if we overlook the fact that we are dealing with events which take place in a particular society. Therefore, for scientific explanation of the exchange value form, capitalist production relations are the essential underlying causal relations. In particular, abstract labor as a conceptual category is necessitated by the need for a realist explanation of exchange value. Immaterial labor is a concrete form of labor which nevertheless must be conceptually converted to abstract labor in order to link it with the alienation and class struggle. The conceptualization of abstract labor as being constituted by the concrete relations of production and exchange under capitalism is the key to resolving the paradox. Marx has already posed in the 1850s, and I quote again, on the one hand, commodities must enter the exchange process as objectified universal labor time. On the other hand, the labor time of individuals becomes objectified universal labor time only as a result of the exchange process. So the two processes of production and exchange of labor validating itself um, as uh, this crucial um, aspect of production under capitalism uh, really work together in a dialectical fashion. Rubin, in his work, correctly pointed out that production for exchange, and we might add for profits to be realized through exchange, leaves its imprint on the production process itself. This imprint of necessity is one of control over labor by capital. Under production with immaterial labor, such control can become inscribed in micro-political processes, as Foucault correctly points out, without grounding his claim in the critical political economy, as I have tried to do so far. It cannot then simply be the case, as even some well-meaning critics such as John Robinson have maintained, that nothing in Marxist system depends on the qualitative labor theory of value. Quite the contrary, almost everything does. In particular, a mature political economy-based explanation of alienation and a revolutionary critique of capital that points to the way of abolishing capital would have to be abandoned if the qualitative labor theory of value is jettisoned. So now we are left with uh, uh, two crucial questions. One, uh, we need to show uh, if it is indeed true that qual qualitative labor theory of value is a deep scientific explanation for alienation and exploitation under capitalism, especially under the postmodern production of subjectivities in the context of immaterial labor. And related to that is the second part. Uh, we have to ask if the qualitative labor theory of value can elucidate the requirements for transition from capitalism towards a classless society. 
I have addressed the second project in my earlier work. It is to the first of the two tasks in the context of immaterial labor that the rest of this lecture will be devoted. I have presented a theory of democracy under postmodern conditions. The defense of a sophisticated form of non-relativist epistemology and ontology under postmodern conditions can be offered, and I have offered such a defense. I will not belabor those preliminary points here, rather I offer the following argument with respect to value and immaterial labor. If immaterial labor is rendered abstract under capital, following and extending Marx and Uno here, it is not simply because exchange equalizes social labor. Prior to exchange in the very relation established by the circuit of productive capital, the hiring of wage laborers who, under the theoretical conditions postulated in this paper, embody immaterial labor and have sometimes strategic locations within both the technical and the social division of labor processes, the general exploitative process of capital wage labor relation is already always well established. Capital, which is dead labor in its monetary form, faces living labor, not as specific individual lives, but as general capacity for work or as abstract labor power. The material form is exploited just as other labor forms are. Furthermore, under the laws of capitalist production, the worker faces domination in the workplace, which is quite independent from whether surplus value is produced or not. Even if the entire value produced is distributed to the workers, say for example under a profit sharing scheme, the domination of capital over labor will still exist as long as technical division of labor within the enterprise continues to be accompanied, accompanied by a hierarchical and non-democratic management system. Under normally functioning capitalism, of course, equal share in the profits of the enterprise is not the case. But this limiting case illustrates clearly what is wrong with the quantitative formulation of exploitation only as the rate of surplus value. Even if the rate of surplus value is zero, there can still be exploitation in the very quality of the production relations themselves. This applies with special force when we consider immaterial labor. And this qualitative relational type of exploitation is conceptually quite close to both Marx's early attempt to conceptualize alienation and more recent attempts on the underlying Aristotelian aspects of central features of the concept of alienation in Marx. In early Marx, the problem is motivated by a conception of the species being of humans. Under capitalist conditions of production, the potential to be a human person, qua a member of this unique species, is thwarted. Of course, it is only much later, after the publication of Darwin's work, that Marx would see the specific natural historical connections between evolution and human potential. Marx's conceptions, I would argue, were quite consistent with a naturalistic view of life that accorded proper importance to the constraints of social institutions in human development. It is only within the social, political, and economic institutions of capitalism that the concept of the proletariat makes any sense. And theoretically, the concept of proletariat embodies in a radical form the complete alienation that occurs under the conditions of wage labor. Dialectically, the proletariat also carries the potential to oppose and finally to overcome capital, a potential that we will discuss more fully in the next section. So uh, uh, if we can connect uh, the qualitative labor theory of value as the central explanatory framework that essentially is connected with uh, the problem of living a good life, we have to conclude uh, that uh, under capitalism this is denied 
the large majority of the people, especially large majority of the people in the dominated countries. In imperialist countries as well, um, as uh, uh, Thronti, Lazzarato and others uh, tried to discuss, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial form, seemingly, of immaterial labor really does not negate the uh, pro uh, uh, domination of uh, this labor, labor power by uh, capital. Uh, we can uh, perhaps look at this from another angle, from the point of view of Foucault. Uh, Foucault shows how the discipline of the army served as the model for discipline in the factory. In fact, for Foucault, virtually every institution is permeated with this disciplinary mode of functioning until a more subtle and manipulative system of control can be developed. Immaterial labor is a part of this system, and yet, as Zinn intuitively grasps in chapter 23 of his A People's History of the United States, a revolt of the guards, many of those who are suppliers of immaterial labor and form part of the social network-based biopolitical organization of advanced capitalism is not inconceivable even in the US. Foucault's concept of biopower is a particularly powerful way of characterizing how the production and reproduction of life itself can become an object of control under capitalism. In Discipline and Punish, Foucault analyzes in detail how the human body can be objectified. The fundamental goal of the disciplinary power was to create a docile body. At the same time, this docile body also needed to be a productive body. Looked at from the perspective of qualitative labor theory of value, this implies nothing less than the total alienation of flesh and spirit. Once again, the problem from the human point of view, in spite of the ironically avowed anti-humanism of early Foucault, then becomes how to overcome this alienation even under the conditions of immaterial labor power. So we can reformulate the question once again. Is there a new contradiction with the development of immaterial labor under capitalism? Hart and Negri seem to think that there is a new contradiction between productive processes that now directly and exclusively rely on modern and postmodern science and affectivity and a unit of measure of wealth that still coincides with the quantity of labor embodied in the product. However, the understanding of value theory here seems quite unclear. Value in monetary form is a measure of wealth, although, as Marx is at pains to point out, it is wealth in an alienated form. Capitalist development, crisis-ridden though it is, leads to a secular increase in the social productivity of labor and an increase in the mass of commodities. To use a Ricardian phrase, capitalist development leads to an increase in the sum of enjoyments. For Ricardo, this can go on till the stationary state is reached. For Marx, increased intensity of class struggle creates openings for the transition to the rule by workers and ultimately to a classless society. Nothing in Marx's general historical argument about capital depends on the development of a specific type of concrete labor form. Furthermore, commodity production can hardly cease even if social productivity of labor is very high and very little labor is embodied in the unit commodity. The capitalists will simply have to find a way of marketing a vast amount of produced goods and services. This may lead to realization problem or even political crisis, but it does not point to an automatic breakdown of capitalism. Political strategies and tactics of the working class and its allies are still of capital importance. Specifically, with respect to effective labor, it may be noted that it will perhaps always be engaged in quite labor-intensive production. By their very nature, services such as emotional nurturing, psychological counseling, or pampering the global rich by providing sexual, emotional services with the appearance of warmth, etc., involve real expenditure of labor time on the part of the providers, many of whom are women. Clearly, the expenditures on the part of the rich 
come out of surplus value and revenue. But as long as surplus value is appropriated by the capitalists privately and as a class, the disappearance of value requires not the magical appearance of immaterial labor and the historical on the historical scene, finally, but the most resolute, skillful, and stubborn class struggle waged by workers and their allies with the ultimate goal of abolishing wage labor and class-based societies and all the cultural practices and ideas that are the mark of such class societies. Only in this way, after an entire historical epoch of struggle, can communism be achieved. The present circumstances require us to conduct such struggles when the ecological crisis is deepening and the global financial system is in a serious crisis. It is logically possible that time is running out and the working class may not be able to carry out its historical tasks on this planet. But we must act in a firm democratic internationalist way under the banner on which is inscribed the abolition of wage labor, the abolition of classes. This particular goal is highlighted by the qualitative labor theory of value and receives additional support from the possibilities of additional and new forms of revolutionary struggles with the appearance of immaterial labor. So immaterial labor is certainly a material force in the struggle towards human liberation. So if, as I have argued so far, the abolition of alienation requires the abolition of capital as a relation of domination, we can see that the qualitative labor theory of value throws much light on how to abolish capital as a social relation with immaterial labor as a key category in our times. This affirmative answer to the initial question posed with regards to human liberation and the role of immaterial labor in this process allows us to focus on value as a social form and the pervasive political, social psychological and cultural connections between production, distribution and social relations on the one hand and alienation under immaterial labor on the other. It also highlights the primacy of the asymmetry of capital labor relation under capitalism. The historical specificity of immaterial labor is not to be denied, contrary to what some old-fashioned theorists might think and claim, we have to acknowledge the specificity of immaterial labor and also the role, at times a crucial role, that it can play in the emancipatory struggles of the present and certainly in the future. It should pose practical problems for revolutionary organization and preparedness. Just as Lenin's analysis of capitalism in Russia in the 1890s posed these problems in a concrete socio-historical context. We can anticipate some of this by mentioning two crucial differences between Lenin's or even Gramsci's approach and the implications of the qualitative labor theory of value with immaterial labor. First, the idea of the vanguard party must be given up and the idea of a network of micro-level organizations in active struggle must be taken up. To some extent, this is actually exemplified by the way the former Soviet Union and Eastern European dictatorial regimes fell. And this indeed should give us hope, although we need to analyze the concrete historical specificities of the societies in which we are located ourselves. Secondly, the revolutionary roles of immaterial laborers, particularly super exploited women and minorities must be analyzed further. It seems to me that in the struggles that are developing under conditions of globalization, a new form of inter internationalization from below is developing with solidarity among workers from the north and from the south. And a lot of the technical advances today uh, that have been uh, used 
uh, both in uh, former Soviet Union and Eastern European countries during their struggles uh, and are used even now by them and the Arab Spring uh, can be thought through critically and used in the struggles that will develop uh, from now on. And I think we must engage in this task because if we care about the future of this planet and the lives of our children and their children, these are challenges that are well worth our collective effort. Thank you.